Good evening, everyone. I'm David Elwood, Dean of the Kennedy School of Government, and I welcome you here to the uh, John F. Kennedy uh, Junior Forum. We are very fortunate tonight to have a exceptional public servant, uh, someone who has served in public service, really, and been, in, been focused on it from a very young age, as I'll mention in a moment. Someone who, I think, is, uh, provides the kind of career that many folks here need to pursue. Now, when I say she served in um, uh, public service over at Institute for a long time, um, she attended her first Republican National Convention at the age of nine, uh, during which she gave, apparently, Dwight Eisenhower a leather golf tee holder that she had made. Uh, so she clearly was a natural, and uh, she went to uh, Wheaton College, graduating in 1968, and she worked for the Nelson Rockefeller campaign. And she still, uh, on occasion, calls herself a Rockefeller Republican. Those of us that remember such a term, uh, remember it with great fondness, um, the sort of combination of, uh, of uh, uh, social conscience as well as uh, uh, fiscal responsibility is a, a very appealing one. She, in her early years, uh, she also served as an outreach re uh, worker for the Republican National Convention and as a staff member at the US uh, Office of Economic Opportunity. She was elected to the Somerset County, New Jersey Board of Chosen Freeholders, where she served until 1988, when then Governor Thomas Keene uh, appointed her to the State Board of Utilities. Uh, in 1993, she defeated then uh, the incumbent Governor James Florio to become New Jersey's first and only female governor. Uh, during her tenure, she appointed New Jersey's first African-American state Supreme Court justice, its first female state Supreme Court justice, its first female attorney general. Then from 2001 to 2003, uh, as all of you know, she served in uh, President Bush's cabinet and was the administrator of the United States Environmental uh, Protection Agency. Um, among her notable accomplishments uh, during this time included the Blue Skies Initiative, uh, the establishment of a water-based approach to lakes and rivers, the brownfields legislation, which brought uh, economic and environmental vitality back to the neighborhoods, and uh, she included and other, a variety of other activities which she can talk to much more than I can, including uh, requiring dramatic reductions in sulfur emissions of diesel engines. 
Uh, Governor Whitman is now the president of Whitman Strategy Group, a consulting firm that specializes in government relations and environmental issues. She's also co-chair of the National Smart Growth Council, a member on the board of the board of directors of the Council on Foreign Relations, a member of a number of uh, corporate boards ranging from Texas Instruments uh, to United Tech Technologies, S.T. Johnson and Company, Sun and Company. And uh, though she's no longer in a public office, she continues to serve the public in a variety of ways, among the ones I just mentioned, plus she serves on the board of directors of the Millennium Challenge Corporation. She's author of the book, It's My Party Too, which was a New York Times bestseller. Uh, she's founder of the head and head of the organization by the same name. So uh, I think their goal is to return the Republican Party to its historic principles of both fiscal conservatism and personal freedom. In short, this is a woman who has great ideals, a great uh, a sense of vision and purpose, and uh, we're very fortunate that she agreed to join us this week as an IOP visiting fellow, and tonight is our speaker. So would you all please welcome Governor Christy Todd Whitman. Thank you very much for that uh, very kind introduction, and I want to thank you, and I want to thank the uh, institution for inviting me here tonight and giving me this, this opportunity to be here. And of course, Governor Shaheen, I know she can't be here for very good reason, but uh, I thank her. There was a time when she and I were the only two female governors in the country. Uh, we had the opportunity to, to share those, some of those distinctions, although now after this last election cycle, uh, there are now nine, which I think is good for the country, quite frankly. It's a, it's a high that we've enjoyed only once before. I also want to thank the Harvard Republican Club and the uh, Kennedy School Republican Caucus for hosting this forum. I, I can't help but think you, you mentioned Rockefeller Republican and being somewhat of an oxymoron that there's a somewhat jarring aspect to the title Kennedy and Republican in the same phrase. But then, um, there aren't, those aren't always words you expect to hear used together, but then again, I understand that because the same thing used to be said when I was part of the President's Cabinet. Uh, some people were surprised to hear the words Bush administration and environmental policy in the same <laughs> phrase. Uh, but I think that neither the Kennedy School Republicans uh, nor Bush environmental protection are oxymorons, at least uh, not entirely. Anyway, they, they do work together. I've been asked to, to speak with you tonight about the politics of the environment, uh, where we find ourselves today and, and where we are going. It is a topic I know a little something about, and I have the scars to prove that. But before we do it, I think it's very useful to get a little bit of a history lesson, to understand uh, how we got to where we are and, and where, where, where we've come. The early political history of environmental policy in America is often traced back to Teddy Roosevelt, uh, Harvard class of 1880. And TR is credited with being the first person, really, much less president, American president, certainly, to raise what was then called conservation into the uh, national consciousness. According to the National Geographic, TR was responsible for the preservation of some 230 million acres during the course of his presidency. And just to put that into perspective, that's approximately equal to the size of every eastern state along the eastern seaboard from Maine to Florida and adding New Hampshire um, as well. Uh, that's a pretty amazing accomplishment. For more than 60 years, Following the Roosevelt administration, conservation was the main way that we thought about uh, the environment. It was the, the basis for the, our ethos on the environment. When President Kennedy signed into law in 1961, forever preserving the Cape Cod, Cod National Seashore, he was recognizing that tradition, and he was part of extending that tradition of conservation of America's natural resources. But, and it wasn't until later in that decade, in the 60s, that we began to think more in the modern environmental terms that we look at today. The publication of Rachel Carson's The Silent Spring in 1963 was a real, 62, excuse me, was a real turning point 
on the way Americans looked at the environment and our responsibility toward it and what we could do. And we, it shifted both the public and the government's focus from preserving pristine areas that were under threat from development to looking at the damage that our modern industrial society was doing to the entire environment, all of the country, not just particular parcels of it. Indeed, by 1969, it was increasingly clear that America was facing some real environmental disasters and challenges. Rivers were spontaneously combusting, the Cuyahoga River in Ohio. People were choking on thick, dirty smog, and much of our country was being used as a toxic waste dump at the time. So before uh, that decade of the 60s was out, we had not only landed a man on the moon and brought him safely back to Earth, we had also begun to recognize that we were doing serious damage to the safety of Earth itself. And that was a total shift in, in mindset. In response, and I know that there are those of you who in this audience will find this a little strange because it's not uh, something we hear much of today, but in response to those crises, Back in the 70s, Republicans and Democrats came together to enact policy to solve a major issue that was recognized by everybody. It wasn't easy. Many Republicans were wary of any kind of federal regulation, and many Democrats thought there could never could be enough federal regulation. But they understood the importance and the need for action, and they were able to put aside their differences and reach compromises and put in place the foundation that still largely defines the way that we protect our environment today. In fact, the vast majority of environmental laws which form the foundation of the way we approach environmental protection were passed by a Congress that was largely controlled by Democrats and signed by a Republican president. And people often forget this. The EPA was established by Richard Nixon in 1970, and that was quickly followed during his administration by passage uh, with bipartisan support, and I think that's important to remember in this day and age, with bipartisan support of such landmark laws as the National Environmental Policy Act, the Clean Air Act, the Endangered Species Act, and the Clean Water Act. And that was followed in subsequent years, that bipartisanship continued under the stewardship of Gerald Ford, Ronald Reagan, and George Bush the 41st, with the Safe Drinking Water Act, the Toxic, Toxic Substance Control Act, the, the Superfund Act, the uh, Oil Pollution Prevention Act of, of 1990, and the, a host of other laws that still and regulations that form the basis of the way we approach environmental protection today. Every one of those in laws was enacted by a Congress that was largely in the hands of one party and signed by a president who was a member of the other party. And the votes were very rarely close. And yet, since 1992, there has only been one piece of major legislation passed to protect the environment. And that was the Superfund Revitalization Act, the Brown, excuse me, the Brownfields Revitalization Act of 2002. That wasn't because we stopped needing environmental protection during that time period, but it's because the, the politics of the times got to the point where we couldn't have the kind of discussions that yielded us the good policies of the past. The politics in Washington became so toxic you couldn't get the kind of bipartisan support that was needed to give us and gave us all those laws in the beginning when we understood the depth of the crisis. I'll give you just one example from my own time at, at EPA to talk about how this divisiveness really, really affects us. It concerns a, a regulation that we promulgated to regulate the emissions from non-road diesel engines. Those are tractors and backhoes. Now, it may surprise you, it certainly did me at the time, to learn that non-road diesel engines are a bigger threat to human health than their on-road cousins, the buses and the trucks that we see going through our communities. And yet there were virtually no regulations on those emissions, and it was time that we do something about it. 
So working with both the engine manufacturers and the environmental community, we brought them together and sat them down at a table. We were able to come up with a regulation that reduced emissions from those engines by 90%. And everybody agreed with it. Everybody was very comfortable. All parties signed on. When we announced the regulation, the National Resources Defense Council actually sent me a letter, and they said this was possibly the most important thing done for human health since lead had been taken out of gasoline two decades before. Now that really felt good to me, because it showed that when you get people to sit down at the table, when you engage in conversation, you really can pass good regulations. You can benefit the people at, a, at large, and I was very Glad to have NRDC's support because it showed we could actually work. Government and the environmental community could work together, again, for the greater good. Well, my euphoria, that didn't last very long. Uh, three days later, I opened the Washington Post and I saw a story that rep reported that the other environmental groups were, in the words of this writer, apoplectic about the letter NRDC had written me. They said that it was, <clears throat> they were worried that the statement would be taken out of context and that it would somehow inhibit their ability to attack the otherwise far from perfect record of the Bush administration. And within a couple of days, another letter landed on my desk from the NRDC basically saying, please stop using that phrase. And this was, they were apparently concerned that expressing support for something good on which they'd worked and with which they agreed, but expressing support for that was bad politics, and we wonder why we can't make progress. It's pretty tough when you face things like that. Of course, the administration was often its own worst enemy as well. They didn't always help things. Because of the conviction uh, by some in my party that environmental policy made in Washington only alienates our base, that nobody wants to hear about it, we often deliberately communicated what we did as if we were only talking to that base, those people that hate regulation, that, that think it's a bad thing. And rather than consistently and forcefully making the case for more innovative environmental policies, we actually fed the feelings of those who felt that there could be no good regulations out of Washington, that it was all going to be bad, and who believed that every regulation was an unnecessary federal intrusion in their lives. President Bush had, however, um, we saw that in several different ways, and President Bush was one of those who unfortunately agreed with this. And that was made uh, abundantly clear in the way, it was, the way it was communicated, and that was made abundantly clear to me early on in the administration with respect to the issue of global climate change. Uh, in the spring of 2001, the White House decided it needed to make a statement uh, about the Kyoto Protocol, that they needed to say something about it, that they were not going to support it. And that should have come as no surprise to anybody. The president had very, been very consistent during the campaign, saying he did not support the protocol. And in fact, he wasn't alone. Uh, several years earlier, the United States Senate had voted 95 to nothing against the principles of the protocol. And the Clinton administration, in fact, had never taken the treaty to the Senate for ratification because they understood how deep and bipartisan the opposition was. So when the president got up and said, we're not going to be part of, of Kyoto, it was uh, really basically saying the emperor has no clothes. It was a recognition of the reality of both sides. But during the campaign, the president had called for a cap on carbon emissions. And as we know, that's one of the, of the most contentious of the greenhouse gases. And early in the administration, I reaffirmed that commitment at the, my first G8 meeting in Trieste of the G8 environmental ministers. Uh, my st statement in Trieste that we were going to put a cap, the president had called for a cap on, on greenhouse gas emissions, was cautiously accepted by my brethren. They weren't inclined to think that this administration was going to be very pro-environment, but they were happy to hear that even though we weren't going to be engaged in Kyoto, we were going to be engaged with the issue, and we were going to enact a cap on carbon. Of course, the minute I said that in Trieste, there were those people at home who, that was a red flag to a bull, and they got very upset. 
Many of the Republicans in Congress and a lot of the industry leaders immediately went to the White House and urged them to repudiate the statement and to reaffirm the fact that they were not in any way, shape, or form supporting anything that, that looked like Kyoto. And before I'd even left Italy, they were lobbying the White House on this issue. And on my way back to the United States, I wrote a, a private memo to the president outlining what I thought our, our position should be on global climate change, how we should approach it, and reiterating that this was a very important issue for the rest of the world, and we ought to be engaged in it. Um, unfortunately, soon after my return to Washington, it became very clear that the administration was not inclined to accept that kind of an approach and they weren't going to listen. In fact, um, the administration had already decided to reaffirm its opposition to Kyoto in language that was designed to appeal to the base back home, and the people back home who thought that really Kyoto was just an excuse for other governments to undermine our economy, and frankly, that global climate change wasn't an issue anyway. And they decided, they also decided though, the administration also decided in this letter to hold off on their promise to regulate carbon, to put a cap on carbon. When I learned from the president in a face-to-face -face meeting we had in the Oval Office where I thought I was going to talk about this issue, that the decision had been made, I was of course uh, extremely disappointed. And as I was leaving the Oval Office, I ran into the vice president who was coming out the other way with, a, with his coat on and a letter in his hand, and he was apparently had the letter that was, he was going to personally hand deliver up to the Hill saying that, that we were not going to go forward with a cap on carbon, much less uh, support Kyoto. The letter was written and signed before I even met with the president on the issue, and now it was about to be delivered. After I left the White House and later on that day, I called my fellow cabinet member and good friend, Secretary of State Colin Powell, to see whether he would be as concerned as I was about the international reaction to what we were doing and the language that was being used. Because sometimes, you know, when you're very involved in an issue, you get too close to it and you, your judgment isn't always 100%. And you need a reality check. So I called Colin and, and I wanted to hear what he said and I shared my concerns to see if he shared them as well. And he did. And in fact, uh, as Karen DeYoung reports in her recent biography of uh, General Powell, that right after my meeting and my telephone call with him, he rushed over the White House to make his case on this issue that uh, we shouldn't disengage in the way that this language in the letter would have us disengage, uh, only to find out that uh, he was too late. The Vice President has, had already left to the Hill in the brief time it took Secretary Powell to get from the State Department to the White House. It was a done deal. And events soon proved that Colin and I were right to have been concerned I had to get on the phone, obviously, and call my G8 counterparts to tell them that what I had told them the week and a half before was no longer going to be the case, that things had changed, and uh, the reaction was not exactly encouraging. And several days later, a London newspaper really captured what I had been hearing in the, in the phone calls. And they said, in a, in a single stroke, the United States has condemned the planet to a more polluted, less certain future. Uh, Mr. Bush has made it clear that he has concerns far more pressing than the health of the global environment. And that was a reiteration, really, of what I had heard from my counterparts around the world. As I look back on this, I am convinced that the consequences and the way in which the Bush administration repudiated the Kyoto Protocol have been far-reaching and they've been persistent. The attitude we presented to the world has hurt us in our ability to conduct foreign policy. It has had an impact on the way we have been able to engage with other countries. And earlier this year, interestingly enough, the president said something somewhat similar. He was being interviewed about the administration and, and America's position on addressing climate change. And he said, well, much of my position was defined early in my presidency when I said the Kyoto Protocol was a lousy deal for the Americans. And then he paused a little bit and said, I guess I, I should have started differently when I first became president. And I would agree. I think that's a, a fair assessment. 
Unfortunately, the hyperpartisanship which has infected environmental policy in Washington extends to most of the other areas of public policy, and I believe very firmly that we all lose because of that. There's no doubt in my mind that the current climate of politics in Washington is as toxic as I have ever seen it. And there are others in the audience who can attest to that in a far more direct and, and personal way than, than I. Uh, far too often today, politics seems to be less about finding practical solutions to problems and more about advancing a partisan political agenda, uh, something we have moved away from in the past. The results of last term's midterm, last month's, last week, excuse me, midterm elections <clears throat> may bring us a much needed change, at least I certainly hope so. President Bush is going to have to compromise if he's gonna get anything done for his legacy uh, over the next two years. And the Democrats in Congress, if they hope to build a record of accomplishment, are gonna to have to meet the White House halfway, at least from time to time. There's gonna to have to be some dialogue that goes on. As we saw in the early days of the environmental movement, that's where much of the really good policy gets done, when both sides come together and people are talking to one another. And there's going to be a lot of opportunity to do that now, going on in the, in the next two years. Addressing global climate change is just one of those areas where they could come together and have a productive discussion. I believe that the administration's heretofore position on climate change, that voluntary programs alone, with some encouragement, is enough, is politically unsustainable. And it was before these elections. I don't think it was going to have stood the test of time. Because many of America's leading companies have already started to take action to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. They have done it voluntarily, and they're, they're taking real steps, both because of the international political climate and because of what they see in, as an inevitable move toward cap on carbon in this country. They want to get out uh, ahead. Those who've been acting, however, don't want to be out there by themselves for a very long time. They'd like a level playing field. They'd like to see other companies in their field required to do the same things that they have taken upon themselves to do voluntarily. And so they're putting pressure on Congress. Their demands, if you link them with those of the environmental community and those of the international community, will, I believe, make the uh, imposition of a mandatory cap on carbon, something that we're going to see in the, actually the very near future, certainly within the next five years. And it gives the president an enormous opportunity to try to change what will be his legacy in the environmental area. And just yesterday, the White House indicated a subtle shift in policy. While they didn't embrace mandatory cap on carbon, they certainly indicated that this was still on the table and they were willing to talk about it. It was taken as a good sign by our international partners, and I certainly think it's a good sign, and I suspect what it is is a, a trial balloon prior to the State of the Union message, that this is something we will hear more of from the President in the course of that message, and that's very encouraging. I really hope that those stories about a, a, a change are not just political posturing, but that they represent a real change, and, and I frankly believe that they do. I mean, you have to remember that as governor, George Bush enact, enacted a cap on carbon. So he's not a stranger to this issue. He knows it can be done, and he knows it can be done in ways that keeps our economy uh, productive and thriving. And if, if he does that, it could change the nature of the political discourse that we have on the environment. And that is a change that I believe is, is long overdue, and one that we as the American people should embrace and should encourage. In March of 1961, President Kennedy said that the task of our time and our generation is to hand down undiminished to those who come after us the natural wealth and beauty which is ours. I don't disagree with that, but I think our challenge today goes beyond that. We need to leave the air cleaner, the water purer, and the land better protected than we found it than we find it today and that we have been given. To meet that task will require real change in the way that the politics of the environment plays out. We cannot continue to allow environmental politics to be conducted by the extremes. 
We have to find that middle ground that will allow for real advance. That's the sort, of the extreme politics is the sort of politics that has only given us one major piece of environmental regulation in the last decade and a half, and it's been that long. Instead, we've got to reclaim the environmental politics of the productive center, the things that we saw between 1970 and 1992, when people came together, set aside differences, found areas of compromise, and served the greater public good. Understanding that that's what you're elected to do. You're elected to serve the public, not a party. And these issues are not partisan. The environment is not Republican, it is not Democrat. While pollsters will tell you that environment is a second tier issue, in the minds of most voters, because we never list it when given an open-ended question to ask to list our top 10 issues. We, we never list the environment. I believe that the results of last month's election signal a desire for change, not just of political control, but of the climate of politics in our country, how we change, how we go about politics. And if the president, and the new leaders of Congress can change that climate, it will be a welcome, a welcome improvement, and coming not a moment too soon. I'm very hopeful that with the continued pressure of the American people, we can see that come to fruition. With that, I'll stop. I thank you very much for having invited me here, and I look forward to the opportunity to answer some questions. Thank you very much. <laughs> Exactly. All right, we now have time for questions. There are four microphones, one located here, one there, one there, and right there. Let me just remind you of the usual ground rules. Uh, questions have several characteristics, the ideal questions. First, they, uh, you describe who you are, briefly. Uh, second, they are short. Uh, third, they are Unit, there is one question, not more than that. And finally, and most importantly, they end with a question mark. So with that, let me uh, start right here. Um, hi, my name is Dadun Singh. I'm a freshman at the college. And towards the end of your speech, you mentioned that we should leave the environment better than we found it. And I agree with that. But I have a question regarding your consulting group um, and how they've represented FMC Corporation, which has been subject to 47 EPA enforcement actions. How can you s make a statement that we need to leave the environment better than we find it and yet represent such a group? Sure. Well, what we do with companies is we try to tell them how they can improve their environmental uh, profile. When companies come to us, they, many of them are ones that have had a bad record and they understand that and they want to start to improve it. So what we do is work with them to say, this is what you need to do. These are the kinds of steps you can take that will keep you competitive but will improve your impact on the environment, reduce your impact on the environment, improve your environmental portfolio. I think the worst thing in the world is to look at an FMC, FMC and say, forget it, guys. You're bad actors and we're going to leave you that way. What we want to do is change behavior. And so what we're doing is working with those companies. Most of them, not all of them, they have bad records by any means. Many of them are very good uh, corporate citizens. But there are those that have problems. And as long as when they come to us, we believe they're sincere and wanting to change that behavior, we're happy to work with them and try to improve what they're doing to the environment and their impact. Thank you. OK. Right up here. Hi, Governor Whitman. My name is Jared Zaffron. I'm a sophomore at the college, originally from Demarest, New Jersey. So, All right. So thank you for Jersey being presence. here. My question is, uh, what do you think about an increase in the gas tax as a solution for climate change problems? Well, there's no question but that Americans respond to economic pressure. And you saw that when the gas prices went up, and all of a sudden, the sale of SUVs and Humvees and trucks fell off and cars like my hybrid suddenly started to take off and people were looking for more of those. So we are very, very price sensitive and that would be a very good way to, that, that certainly would have an impact. You'll never get it passed. Uh, I tried to get a gas tax increase in New Jersey which has one of the lowest gas taxes in the region in the Northeast and I couldn't get it through the legislature. I wanted to use the money raised from that to help preserve open space. I couldn't even get the legislature to begin to talk about it. What we should do and what Congress can do more easily than that is require the auto companies to raise the gasoline mileage. Uh, they did it in the first year of this Bush administration and they raised it 2.4 uh, gallon, gallon, miles per gallon. 
which is nothing. We can do a lot better than that. But if you're looking for kind of a realistic change that will affect behavior, I think that will be more practicable than trying to get a gas tax increase through. Right up here. Hi, thank you for coming. Um, my name is Sarah Rasmussen. I'm a master's student here at the Kennedy School. And I definitely agree with what you're saying about needing to work bipartisan, in a bipartisan manner to get you know, good environmental legislation passed in Congress over the next two years. But given that many of the uh, members of the GOP that lost office this year were the moderates, mm -hmm. do you think that's going to be a roadblock? And if so, how do we get around that? Yeah, I mean, that's a very good point. Unfortunately, many of the Republicans who lost were the more moderates because they were in the competitive districts. The ones who are left standing tend to be the more ideological. They're in districts that reflected them and, and they don't have to compromise. In fact, it's not a good thing for them to do that because all they do is alienate their base. But there's still a lot of Republicans who understand the importance of the environment who are left standing. And you have what I think is a very good uh, political change, which you had the leaders of the evangelical community come forward about a year ago and say climate change is a real issue and government has a responsibility to act. And I think a combination of the pressure from the business community who is facing now some 37 different states that are taking action relative to greenhouse gas emissions, which create a patchwork quilt that's impossible to deal with if you're, a, if you're a business, trying to meet 37 different sets of standards, they would like a national standard. You have the multinational corporations who are going to be required to bench their greenhouse gas emissions and show reductions if they're going to be competitive in any country that has actually um, ratified the protocol. And then you've got the evangelical community coming forward. And that, I believe, creates a dynamic that is going to allow for the kind of changes that we're looking for. Okay. Right down here. Uh, my name is Will Quinn. I'm a freshman at the college, originally from Chatham, New Jersey. Um, and my question is, uh, I'm out the Rockefeller wing of the Republican Party, mm -hmm. which you know I really identify strongly with. But um, I was. Over the, over the course of the last month's elections, uh, I really kind of had an identity <coughs> crisis in that way. Like, why should I remain a Republican if none of the issues that, uh, the social issues that I care about are being discussed? Um, you know, where do I go? Am I better off just registering as a Democrat or becoming an independent? Uh, and where do people like me go um, that, you know, want to take back the party? Oh, I love questions like that. I've got an easy answer for you, www.myparty2.com. <laughs> It's what I started. It's a political action committee that I started with a book that I wrote. And uh, Impact is about giving a voice to the moderates, the centrists, the, I like to say, thinking Republicans. <clears throat> there are others out there, like us, that uh, we realize that there are many instances where there's no all right or all wrong answer. It's not about any one of the particular social issues. I have a board of directors of 55 plus who are current and former members of Congress and the Senate, governors, and just well-respected names within the Republican Party. They're some pro-life, some pro-choice. That's not what we're about. We're about you can agree to disagree without being disagreeable. Um, you can be a pro-choice or a pro-life Republican. That's okay. You don't have to hate the other person. And there's no sin in talking to members of the other party in order to get something done for the public. And what we have done is really focused on particularly the state and local level. We uh, endorsed a bunch of candidates this round. We had about 67 that won. And we are continuing to be very active, and we're gearing up now for the interim where we're going to start to, we have active organizations in 21 states and members from every state in the union. And uh, we're going to use the website and use the organization to give people a voice. Because there's strength in numbers, there's strength in money. We raised about a million five this year. And when people start seeing that, we say, hey, we're here. We're going to vote. We're going to vote the way we talk. And we want to see people actually enacting policy. So I still think, I believe very strongly in fighting from within the party rather than giving it up and walking away because I believe in the basic principles of the Republican Party. So I am going to continue to do that. And impact is the way that, that I'm trying to make that difference. Thank you. Right over here. Hi, Governor Whitman. My name is John Gould. I'm a freshman at the college. Um, you gave a lot of details and analysis on Bush administration environmental policy, but one thing that was conspicuously absent was the infamous Cheney Energy Task Force. Do you... The, the what? I'm sorry. The Energy Task Force, led by mm -hmm. Vice President Cheney. If you know who was on that committee and what was discussed, could you share it with the group? And if you don't, sure. do you believe it should be made public? Uh, the committee that I know about was made up of the Cabinet. That's the only committee that I know about. And I was on that, so I was there at the meetings. 
And at those meetings, at the meetings we had with the cabinet, there was nobody else president. It wasn't there. It was when the vice president and others went back to their offices that they would meet, I think and presume, and pretty well know, but I didn't ever look at the ledgers, with people from uh, the industry. But never in the, in the energy task force meetings. And the energy task force report was one that we, into which we all had some input. Um, I will tell you, for instance, that when I first walked in the door for the first energy task force meeting, I was told immediately, and it was almost a generally accepted premise, that the reason we were having brownouts and blackouts in California was environmental regulation, that we had stopped the ability of any new production facility coming online. And so I said to them, well, give me a list of companies that are ready to go with new generating facilities, and I'll take a look and see what it is we can do to, to move them through. They'll have to jump through all the hoops, but we can put them to the top of the list. I think they came back with two. Uh, it was hardly environmental regulation that was causing the problem, although that was something people wanted to blame, and that was a general sentiment. But, um, you know, I wasn't there in the vice president's office to know whom he met with uh, outside of that, but at the actual task force, it was just the cabinet and the administration. Do you believe it should be made public who he met with? You know, that's, I believe we ought to know who, you know, to me, frankly, as far as the, the energy report goes, it really doesn't matter who they met with. What's important is the report. Uh, does it answer the questions that we have? Does it solve our problems? I'm not nearly so interested to know as who was meeting with them as what came out. What, is, what do the American people have before them? What did the Congress have before them? How do you judge it? There have to be some opportunities when members of an administration can have private meetings. But what's important is what's the policy at the end of the day? Do you agree with that or do you disagree with that? Um, I know there are times when I've seen some bills come down from the Hill where the language was absolutely taken from a, a lobbyist, from an industry association group. And that causes me real trouble. But um, for the Energy Task Force, I think that a lot of that was a smokescreen just for going after the administration. What was far more important was was that energy policy the right balance for the country. And I think that's the discussion we should have had, that's the debate we should have had, and to have had it all focus on who met with whom when was a way to get around having the debate on the serious issue that most affects us. Thank you. Right up here. Hi, I'm Clint Trout from the, uh, I'm a graduate student at the School of Public Health. And uh, he actually took part of my question, <laughs> but uh, what, I, I would like to hear your perspective on how the Vice President has impacted the environmental policy in the last six years. Well, clearly this Vice President is the most influential Vice President in my lifetime. And his, one of his areas of particular interest and focus is the environment. And I can't say that I think other than, than open space for hunting, um, his sensitivity to the environment is, is all that deep. And I do have some issues with those kinds of policy changes that, I mean, on climate change, that was something about which he cared a great deal. New Source Review, which is an important part of the Clean Air Act, um, and the changes to New Source Review were very much directed by the Vice President and his office, and, and I just disagreed with where they were coming out on those things. So I would not put him in the category of being the greenest member of the administration by any stretch, and he certainly is extremely influential. Thank you. Right up here. My name is Deborah Decker. I'm a research associate here at the Belfer Center. And leading into the 2008 presidential election, there's been some discussion about Hillary Clinton, Barack Obama as a ticket, and John McCain and Christy Todd Whitman as a ticket. What's your feeling on that, and um, what's your relationship with John McCain? Well, let me take the first part first. Um, I doubt that you would see a Hillary Clinton, Barack Obama ticket. I don't know that the, the country, frankly, being very, very honest, I don't think the country necessarily would accept that. It's too extreme on the, the one or the other, yes, but the two together might be more than the country is, is ready for or will willingly accept. I happen to think, you know, both of them are very articulate and both of them are, would be strong candidates. I just don't see them together. John McCain has a problem. As, as conservative as he is socially, he still isn't mindless enough for some of the people who control the levers of power in the Republican Party because he has stood up against things like the war. And there are those who feel that if you're a Republican, you're a Republican all the way. And if, if impact is to have any kind of an impact, I will say I'd like to see that 
By 2008, the Republican Party would honestly consider a John McCain, a Rudy Giuliani, a Tom Ridge, or the governor out in Hawaii, Linda Lingle, for the presidency. Proven vote getters who have won and run in Democrat states have done well and are, and are respected leaders and yet couldn't get through the process today because it's too narrow. And I'm certainly not running for anything at the moment. Thank you. Are you? Hi, I'm Max Bazerman. I'm a professor at the Harvard Business School. And I appreciated your description of the compromises that occurred through 92, as well as your reflections on 2001 since. It, it was that period in the middle that confused me a little bit. Um, many people would say that we move beyond compromise to something better, problem solving, and your predecessor um, enhanced the use of Project XL, which allowed people to come up with wise trades. And similarly, we had habitat conservation plans in the interior. And both of these were models of coming up with wise regulation rather than less or more. And then many of us saw the destruction of the use of those tools after Bush became president. So I'm interested in your view about looking for wise regulation rather than more or less in a compromise, as well as why those programs seem to have dissipated um, after Bush became president. Well, I, you know, I, I don't disagree that we need wise uh, regulations and that uh, Project XL is something that uh, did give people an opportunity to really participate in the kind of uh, regulatory framework that we had and I was certainly a supporter of it um, and anything we can do to help enhance the uh, public's understanding of the issues is very good. I wouldn't say that we enjoyed a period of necessarily um, all environmental progress. I mean don't forget things like Mercury, there was never a mercury standard in, in the Clinton administration. In fact, they were sued by the environmental community. There were a lot of lawsuits against the Clinton administration for not moving forward, possibly more than, than might be expected because expectations were higher. They expected more to come out voluntarily from the program. So I don't think anybody owns um, a perfect record on this. I, certainly this administration doesn't, but the Clinton administration has some questions that they had to answer too on it. And what we need to do is to get back to the place where the American people are really engaged in this. That's where I think we've lost a lot of the momentum. And I will give Al Gore a lot of credit. While I don't believe that he invented global climate change, and I question the fact that after uh, Kyoto was clearly not going to be accepted by the Congress that they never moved to enact regulatorily a cap on carbon. The fact that he made the movie An Inconvenient Truth has done wonders for the debate and the discussion. It has raised the issue in the public mind. It is getting people talking about something that's very important. And that will help re-engage them, which will make the difference. And will force, I mean, what we have seen and that this administration's reaction to things like the environment, even the good things. I mean, even when we did the, the non-road diesel regulation, we didn't talk about it because the, everything was filtered through the political prism that, that said that our base didn't like these things. They didn't consider this to be a, a big issue. It meant more regulation, and they didn't like regulation. So you didn't even talk about uh, the things that were positive that were done. And yet so much could have been accomplished had we done that. So I think there's a lot of room for improvement, yes, but it's not just one side or the other. Both sides, all sides have, have room for improvement. And, it's only going to happen when we as the American people start to engage and start, you know, as I said, when you give people an open-ended question, they'll never list the environment. When you give them a list of 12 or 15, it may be 14. We need to get more engaged. We need to say this is an issue about which we care and we expect you, our elected representatives, to deal with this and start to move forward, whether you call it compromise or whether you call it common sense regulation. You know, the other thing that, that has always um, frustrated me about the environment is so many people will phrase it as an either-or debate, that it's a zero-sum game. Somebody loses for somebody to win, that you can't have a healthy green environment and a thriving economy. And that's just not true. You can and, in fact, must have both those things. Um, the economy, it, you don't see an economy thrive where people don't have clean air to breathe and clean water to drink and open space to enjoy quality of life. And the environment definitely and desperately needs a healthy economy in order to be able to invest in the next generation of pollution prevention and be able to buy public lands and take them off the rolls. And we need to break that mindset that says you can't have those two things and see how we can more creatively engage 
You need to have a balance. You need to have regulation and enforcement of those regulations, and you also need to have and provide some flexibility to the private sector to be able to reach the regulatory standards in a way that keeps them economically competitive. And that's the biggest challenge, I think, that we face right now. Right here. Hi, Governor Whitman. Uh, my name is Jim Cooney. I work here at the Ash Institute and, more importantly, hail from Kearney, New Jersey. Exit All right. 15 Go, New W Jersey. on the turnpike. We've got a lot of New Jerseyans here. <laughs> and um, everything you've said about bipartisan cooperation and uh, pragmatic approaches to such a political, highly political issues is very encouraging. And if I could just get you to look to 2008 one more time and uh, speculate in a perfect world, um, all polls aside, uh, what kind of person or people, you can name several names, do you see as leading the nation? Well, I think we desperately need people who will stand up and be leaders, who will talk about some of the more difficult issues. I mean, what we've seen the parties do, as I mentioned before, is get away from the competition for the big center and focus solely on their basis. Because when you compete for the big center, you have to talk about real issues. You have to talk about Social Security. You have to talk about the donut hole in Medicaid Part D. You have to talk about the war. You have to come up with positions that are going to make some people mad. And right now, people are disinclined to do anything that is going to make people mad. The theory is, if I can do better getting my base out than you do getting your base out, I win. And the bases are partisan, so you become more partisan. And the way you excite a partisan base is you throw out the red meat issues, the ones that don't necessarily impact us in our everyday lives, uh, flag burning, stem cell research, uh, same-sex marriage, all in big issues, but not necessarily the ones that really affect us every day, and, but those are the ones that get people really emotionally engaged. And so what we need is someone who is willing to go beyond those and say, no, I really am serious about reaching out to the center, because that's where the majority of the voters are. Interestingly enough, Hillary Clinton has started that, and she's getting ripped apart by the liberal Democrat blogs for doing it, for being too moderate, for moderating too much. Uh, the same thing happens to Republicans, and it's time for the public to stand up and say, this is what we want. What we want is progress. We don't elect people to represent their parties. We elect them to represent us. We vote for them with a party label giving us some kind of an understanding of how they might approach problems. But I don't believe we elect people with the, with the feeling that they will always represent their party above all else, no matter what is good for their constituents or their district. We do expect people to think a little bit when they get in office. And we need to have that kind of a person or people at the top of the ticket who will be willing to talk about things like global climate change and say, you know what, gang, it really is an issue. And we need to address it, but we can be smart about it. There are ways we can do it. We've got some examples already out there that we've done with the environment, uh, the Clean Air Act amendments of 1990 and the acid rain trading program. Good way to give business an opportunity to make some money while they're doing the right thing. And we found, in fact, that by doing that, they did more than they were asked for by regulation. They did it faster. They did it at half the cost. So uh, there are ways of addressing this, but we need leadership that will speak to it. Right up here. Hi, Governor. My name is Brett Thomas. I'm a freshman. Um, carbon dioxide emissions and global warming are a truly international issue. So I'm wondering what kind of policy, <clears throat> excuse me, you think America could advance uh, that would include the whole international community rather than just American industry and American consumers. Well, actually, it's uh, one of your compatriots who are having an interesting discussion this afternoon who suggested something that I think is, is absolutely right. We have in this country something called the Chicago Climate Exchange. It's the only place in the United States where we actually trade greenhouse gases, where there's a benchmarking and a price established and it trades greenhouse gases. And the European Union has decided that cap and trade is in fact a way that they're going to try to move to meet their budgets under Kyoto, and so they are very much engaged in it. One of the biggest pushbacks from the developing countries is the fact that they look at us and say, and, and all of us, all the developed world, and say, you just want us to stop burning fossil fuels because you don't want us to get the kind of economies that you've got. Your economies grew burning fossil fuel. This is how you got to be big and strong economies, and you're just trying to hold us back. We have a right to do whatever we can to help our people and to expand our competitiveness in the global marketplace, and that means using the cheapest, most available fuel, which for many people are fossil fuels, and they tend to be the dirtiest. If we can put some kind of an economic incentive there 
to provide for the, a way to move away from that kind of thing, if we can use technology development, if we can help them leap over the industrial age, we will have done great service. But you can't expect them just to go to a non-fossil fuel environment because it's very expensive, they don't have the ways to get there, and they don't have the technology. We've got to be part of that, and if, again, if they're given some economic incentive, and cap and trade trading may be part of that, if we can encourage them and China and India coming into any kind of a global trading partnership would be enormous because of the amount that you could get there. Um, that would be very important, and I think that's the kind of thing we have to be smart about. Uh, unlike at my first meeting of the G8 in Trieste when one of the religious leaders that we had there got up and said, well, we just have to tell the third world they can't expect to achieve the economies of the developed nations. And my feeling was, boy, I don't want to be the one to tell them that. Um, that's not a message I want to deliver, but this is why they are so concerned. And none of the developing, so-called developing nations are, are part of Kyoto, and that's one of the reasons why. We have time for just two more questions, one out of here. Hi, thank you very much for coming. My name is Sarah Erhard, and I'm a student here at the Kennedy School. And prior to coming here, I spent two years working on Canada-US water issues. So I'd like to turn uh, the discussion to water policy, if I could. I'd be really interested to see what you feel are the most important future directions for uh, the US federal government and water policy, and specifically around uh, transboundary water issues. Thanks. Well, actually, I've been saying for some time that I think the number one environmental issue of this century is water, quantity and quality, uh, in this country and around the world. Uh, it's extraordinary when you look at the number of deaths in other parts of the world from bad water quality. And if you look at what's happened even in the western United States on water quality and quantity, one of the big issues we have is the water infrastructure, uh, sanitary sewers and septic systems. The cost of repairing our infrastructure, and many of our cities have aging water infrastructures. In New York, the, the water is delivered in pipes that were laid during Abraham Lincoln's time. And the estimates are anywhere from 500 billion to a trillion dollars. Well, no one entity can deal with that. Uh, no one state can answer to spend all that money. The federal government can't, the utilities can't, and the taxpayer, the, the ratepayer certainly can't. It's gonna have to be a combination of them. One of the things that we did um, and introduced when, when I was at EPA was a watershed-based approach to water management. One of the biggest challenges that we have in water pollution in this country today is non-point source pollution. It's the stuff that each of us do every day. And it all, everything we do, even if you don't live right next to a river, there's a storm drain somewhere near you. And when there's a heavy rain incident, all that water goes into a storm drain. And if you've over-fertilized your lawn or if you've used a lot of pesticide, guess what? That washes right down into the storm drain, out into the, to a lake or a river or eventually the ocean. And there's as much oil deposited along the coastline United States every eight months from non-point sort pollution, the kind of things that we do every day, as was released during the Exxon Valdez spill, which remains our number one single environmental disaster. And that's every eight months. So we have a real impact, but it's very hard to educate people about their role, their cumulative impact of their actions. Uh, one of the things we did was we entered into an agreement with the Meteorological Association because we found in studies that the public is more, most in the learning mode watching the news during the weather. Because we have all those neat maps and you have arrows going here and you have highs and lows and all this kind of stuff and we're learning. And we're willing to learn. So what we did is worked with the meteorologists, and it's a pilot program in, in Maryland and a couple of other places now, to say, look, when you're forecasting a heavy rain coming, add to that, don't fertilize your lawn tomorrow because it's going to rain like stink the day after. And all that is going to wash down into, you live in this watershed. It's going to wash down into this stream. It's going to impact this river, this lake, or this, this body of water. There are things like that that we need to do to uh, try to get a handle around it. And we're going to have to figure out a financing mechanism for the, this aging in infrastructure that we have throughout our country because it is an enormous, enormous problem. And it's not going to go away. It's only getting worse the more we ignore it. Last question. Hello. My name is Christiana Fragel, and I'm not a freshman. I'm a <laughs> mid-career. And um, I have um, a question for you regarding future steps that the U.S. government can take regarding the climate change policy. Primarily, you talked about cap introducing a cap-and-trade system similar to the European trading scheme, but 
What do you think about a tax on carbon as well, and possibly a tax on carbon that would be revenue neutral for the companies? And also, uh, if you could say a word on your position on the current case pending in front of the Supreme Court on CO2 mm -hmm. emissions uh, emitted by vehicles. Well, a cap on carbon, a tax on carbon, is certainly something that has been talked about recently. And there are a number of companies, actually, that support a cap on carbon, I mean a tax on carbon. I don't see that passing the Congress. I think you're much more apt to see a cap and trade approach that doesn't require increasing taxes. And you don't even have much sentiment on the Democrat side of the aisle for increasing taxes. They've been pretty clear about that. And they've been very careful to try to reassure people that they understand the importance of economic competitiveness. So I'm not sure that you're going to see something like that happen. Whereas if they were to introduce a mandatory cap, put it out far enough in the future, and then say, companies, you get there as you will in a way that keeps you economically competitive. But come that date certain, we're going to regulate you and we're going to come in and enforce it. And you're going to see real penalties if you haven't achieved the targets. Then you'll see a change in behavior if what we experienced under the SO2 acid rain trading program is any example. So you're much more apt to see that. As far as the Supreme Court case is concerned, if you look at the language, enabling language of the EPA under the Clean Air Act, it's pretty easy to see how you can include carbon in that because it's a very broad definition. But I don't think, and again, it depends on how the case is argued, and I'm not familiar enough to know how the approach they're going to take, but I don't believe you're going to see the Supreme Court mandate that EPA regulate carbon, but they're going to say EPA does have a responsibility, does have the ability to regulate carbon. But that's not what's going to get us to a cap. It is going to be these other pressures from the states, what the states are doing, from the business community, from the evangelical community. That's what's really going to move us in this direction. And as I said, the Bush administration uh, just yesterday, the head of, of the Council on Environmental Quality, Jim Connaughton, uh, gave a fairly lengthy interview on, the, on what the administration was looking at. And he didn't take a ca mandatory cap on carbon off the table, which is significant. Thank you all very, very much. Thank you, Governor, and for both the uh, thoughtfulness here, but also a vision for how we can actually get to work on some hard problems. Um, for those of you that didn't get a chance to ask your question, whatever, we're going to have a brief reception right behind the podium here right now. Uh, the rest of you, uh, safe trips home. Thanks very much. <laughs>